This morning, I, I, I want to talk to you about the true and living God. I read a book not too long ago, well, a couple of years ago now. It was called, Your God is Too Small. You ever met these people? Their God is too small. We thank God for our food. I told you about that prayer meeting I was sitting in. The prayer meeting where we prayed for goodness about 15 minutes. Because this little boy was at school and he scraped his knee. You're like, pray for 15 minutes. Here's the God that can transform our city. He can change, change kingdoms and rulers. Here's, God's, here's, the, here's our, God, our great and true and living God that can do all that more, more than anything else. That's, that shows his power more than anything else is he can change you and he can change me. The transformation. But some of us, your God's too small. You see, you see your issues in your life, you go, oh, you know, like I, I take, I thank God for that and I thank God for that, but this issue is too, like, what am I going to do? I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call a friend and I'm going to sit and I'm going to just blah, 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 to my friend and get that friend to help me. When you have a connection with the true, and the, I think it's F.B. Meyer book. I want to say F.B. Meyer. Your God is too small. I'll get, I'll get you the, composer, uh, the author of that book. There is a battle in the United States. Well, there's a battle going on right now for America and Canada. If you don't know, you just... I'm not paying attention. There's a huge battle going on for these countries. And it's a deep, deep spiritual battle. You just listen to news. If you can find some news that you can rely on, I don't know where that is. But, but there was a battle many years ago, and the north was fighting the east. I'm joking. The north was fighting the south. And they were in battle. And someone went to Abraham Lincoln and they said to Abraham Lincoln, because they, they knew that Abraham Lincoln was a believer, and they said to Abraham Lincoln, who side is God on? Whose side is God on? And he said this, the question is not whether God is on our side, the north or the south. The question is, are we on God's side? You hear that? Huge. Are we on God's side? I think of your family routine and your family priorities. I think of your days. I think of your retirement years. Are you, you sort of say, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a liberal. I'm a, I'm a well, I'm a conservative. I'm a Toronto Maple Leaf fan. Is God on the side of the Toronto Maple Leafs? Was God sitting there in his in the jersey rooting for the Leafs last night? <laughs> There's some wonderful hockey players in the in the NHL. And I'll get I'll get back to this, but there's just some wonderful hockey players that the Lord has I know the Lord is with them. Mike Gartner was one, and some of you will remember Mike Gartner. And I remember Mike Gartner came to Jackson's Point and gave his testimony. And his testimony was this. He said, there was Russian hockey players that were like half my age that came into the NHL, and I could skate faster than them. It made no sense, he said. I should not have been able to skate faster, but God made me fast, so, so I would have a testimony when I retired. He says, I, I look at all the goals I scored in the NHL. It makes no sense. I shouldn't have been able to score that many goals. But God helped me score those goals so that I have a testimony to preach about him. And here's something just, just recent up to last night. I won't get into it. But a really, I was going to say a friend. He's, I, I don't know him personally. But the goaltender for San Jose Sharks, James Reimer. Look him up. For a long time, on the back of the James Reimer helmet was the boss of Paul. James Reimer is a wonderful Christian. And whenever James Reimer wins a game, or even after every game, he always puts his glove up to, and thanks the Lord. 
He's not saying, thank you, Lord, for being on my side and allowing me the victory. He's saying, Lord, thank you for the strength to be able to do this. James Reimer is a wonderful Christian man. And God is giving him a career that after his career, he will have a testimony powerfully. So the question is, is not whether God is on our side, but is, is God on, are we on God's side? Are we on God's side? I was listening to Tim Delaney, I think his name was, and he talked about three gods. He talked about the three most popular gods of our today, three most popular gods of today. They are the God of my cause, the God of my cause, the God of my understanding, and the God of my experience. The God of my cause, this this is my cause and God's on my side. This is my understanding, and God, God, I, God, and I understand each other. And this is God of my experience. This is. Uh, let me be clear with you. God cannot be contained. This is this is deep. This is this is deep. This is heavy. And. But. We could do sermonettes for Christianettes. But I think. This is important to be talked about. God cannot be contained in our ideology, in our personal opinion, or even in our theology. God is bigger than that. He's big. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. If you think there's, nothing, there's something he can't, oh, he can't transform my family. He can't help me in my business. He can't get me out of this sin that I'm involved in. I can't, I can't. <clears throat> Your God's too small. Your thinking of God's too small. There is, uh, I won't mention their names, but sometimes they come to your door. <laughs> you know what? I admire them. In the fact of their, they're out there. The Salvation Army used not used was a few years ago. The army wasn't so boring. We're becoming more and more boring. I could go on about that. We used to be on the street. We used to do that kind of stuff. And if ever this, if ever the world needed the Salvation Army, it's now. But we've become invisible. We're invisible. We used, to, we used to sing in the streets about how great our God was. But now we're very sophisticated and we don't do that anymore. But I was, uh, a friend of mine, not me, but a friend of mine was having a conversation with these two gentlemen that were knocking at his door. And he says, I want to talk to you. I want to, you got, yeah, yeah. He says, I want to talk to you about the, the Trinity. See, we, we Christians... We believe that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, three persons, co-equal in power, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they said, they said, oh, uh, that's, that doesn't, we can't explain that. We can't explain that. So we don't believe that. They don't believe in the Trinity. And this, my friend, he, who was a very clever guy, he said to these three, two gentlemen, he says, if we can explain God, if we say this is what God's like, then we don't have God anymore. He is bigger than our theology. He's bigger than your personal opinion. He's bigger than your ideology. He's bigger than your thoughts. Our God is big and powerful. That's why the scripture says, who is like our God. Now, just to make sure that you're with me, I want you to say that with me. Who is like our God? Can you, don't sit there so defeated. Christians, like, oh, oh, you know, what are we going to, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing he can do. Who is like our God? Say yes, please. Who? Yeah? God stops being God when we can understand him. Let me say that again. God stops being God when we can... Sit down, son. I'll I'll tell you who God is. 
if I think of the Kirk, uh, if I think of this quote, if it comes in my roller decks in my mind, I'll tell you it. It may come later. So there's a quote coming as soon as I find it up my little squirrely nest up there. God stops being God when we can understand him because he's beyond our thinking. He's beyond our thinking. And here's to C.S. Lewis. Thank you for your help back there. I know, I know I'm bouncing all over the place. But here's, here's a good place. This is what C.S. Lewis said about our God. Looking for God is like fishing for a... This is for Jerry. Looking for God is like fishing for a giant shark. You throw your line over the side and then the strike. And now you have more than you can handle on the line. Have you ever been fishing? I went fishing in Northwest Territories, Yellowknife. They took me up there. It was the longest weekend of my life. <laughs> because that's all they did all day. It was a men's retreat. All day long they fished. Gary? <laughs> that's all they did. And I'm, I'm there, and I'm all by myself there, because we were on an island way up north. It was freezing cold and they gave me a fishing pole and I'm in the water and they gave me these overalls and I was thinking what am I doing here I should have stayed in school so I'm there and I'm just saying Lord please don't let any fish come on my line because I was all by myself and I don't want to take that stupid thing off the hook and I don't want to kill the thing and they're pike, they're about this big when you meet God it'd be like being in a boat fishing and getting a big white shark on your line and then you're going I remember this Fateen Crisco uh, she came and did our youth councils in Toronto and she said this one thing. She says, when you come to the Lord, when you come to God, he messes you up royally in a good way. He turns your life upside down. Have any of you ever experienced that? You come to Christ and boy, he takes your life and he turns it upside down because he's, he's beyond. Oh, but we sit with God of my cause. This is my cause. I know how this should be run. I know what they should do here. This is the God of my understanding. And God says, ah, I tell you, I'm beyond all that. Here's another one. C.S. Lewis said this. He says, I know God can't be a figment of my imagination because he's not at all like I imagine him to be. I pray, my prayer is this, is that you get a big giant shark fish on your line and he comes into your life and changes your imagination about who he is. You know, Canada used to be a Christian nation and I don't believe it is anymore, but statistics will tell you that we are about 80 to 85% believe in God. 85% percent believe in God. So atheism is not an issue for Canadians. It, it's, it, it's not the issue. The issue is, who is that God? What is that God in your mind? What is the God in your mind? Who is that God? What does he look like? What can he do? You see, because you have 80% of people in Canada that believe in God, but you have 65% that believe in abortion. Because God is, in their, in their minds, that, that's who God is. He's a God of their cause. He's a God of their understanding. He's a God of their experience. No, our God is our big It's interesting because in Exodus 20, God is speaking. And guess who he's speaking to? God is speaking to his people. God is speaking to his people. 
And in Exodus 20, he says this to them. He says, He says, I am the Lord your God. Keep in mind, he's speaking to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. He's speaking to God's people. What was the problem? They had a idea of God in their mind that wasn't real. They hadn't met the real God. They had a God of their cause, their God of their understanding, their God of their experience. But they didn't have the real and living God. Do you? It was interesting. I was. We, we, we get very busy in creating God in our image. We get very busy. Let me read you this Psalm 50. Sorry about that. Psalm 50, 21. When did, did these things. Uh, when you did these things and I kept silent. Ready? You thought I was exactly like you. So when God is silent in your life, you sort of say, well, he hasn't said anything. God is saying, you think I'm exactly like you? There's no God. There's no one like our God. We're busy creating Listen, we're busy creating a God like us. Are you following this? I pray so. I know, I, I think I said something last week. I said, I'm, I, I really get myself into trouble when I study too hard because I, I get too into it. But hear this. We think we have a God that looks like us, thinks like us. And we don't like God when we bump into the real God and what he's asking of us, what he's expecting of us, he's holy, holy, holy. When we meet that God, we, <laughs> we start making up our own God. We say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not bound to that. The God I know is not like that. The God, the God that I know, this, this, he, we have the same cause. It's interesting because in Genesis 1.27, I was reading this for the doctrine class. 1.27, it says, and let us make man in our image. And you know what we're doing today? We're not letting God, we're not remembering that God made us in his image. We're making God in our image. We've switched it. We've switched it. We've switched it. God is not liberal He's not conservative. He's not a leaf man. He doesn't sit on the left. He doesn't sit on the right. Our, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And we need to meet him. I want to read you Psalm 50. Psalm 50, 16. Psalm 50, there it is. But to the wicked person, God says, what right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instructions and cast my words behind and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him and throw in your lot with the adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You sit and testify against your brother and sister, and you slander your own mother's son. When you did these things, and I kept silent, you thought, you thought, I was just like you. You thought he was just like you. I want to talk to you about just just briefly here. Corinth. Corinth was a very busy city. Lots of people there. The Jews, the Greeks, the Romans all lived there. There were many, many, many religions there. There was money. There was the the, the center of sport. 
It was a very busy place. Lots of temples, lots of idols. And, and who comes on the scene but Paul? And Paul wants to make sure that they didn't fashion God in their image. He wants to make sure that they didn't make God in his, in their own image. They wanted to make sure they knew the true and living God. So Paul writes a letter in 1 Corinthians. And for chapter 1 that was read this morning, he tells you who God is. Because he wants them to get it straight. Now bear with me. Here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 1 to 10, which was read before. I'll read it again. I want you to do something for me. I want you to count how many times he says about Jesus and how many times he says about God. All right? You can, you can see it. Actually, you can read with me. You can read with me and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through this. Ready? Here we go. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ by the willing of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ and called to be holy people together with all the, those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord, their, their, their Lord and ours. Verse 3. Verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see what he's trying to say? He's trying to say this is the truth. This is the God. And this is what we need to say in our churches. This is what we need to say in our churches. Do you realize that prosperity gospel, the churches are exploding. I had a friend who just moved to New Zealand. She was telling me about her, her time in New Zealand. The core, the Salvation Army core there is so small. They meet every second week. Because they, they, I don't know what they're doing actually. But anyway, but there, there's one church. And it's a prosperity church. And it's busting at the seams. But I want you to know the prosperity church. They're giving people the product of God. But not God. Here's the products of God. This, these are the benefits of God. But you don't have to come to God. Here's the products of God. They're giving them the products of Jesus Christ. But they're not looking for Jesus. And, then, and this one quote goes on. Let me have Christ in sickness or well, in rich or poor, live or dead, for sin, for guidance, for the power, for him to be king. That's what I want. I want Jesus. Not the products of Jesus. Not the products of Jesus. Verse 4. Verse 4. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given in you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have enriched in every way with all kinds of speech, with all knowledge. God, this confirming in our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm in the end to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who, who, is called into, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there will be no divisions among you, but that you will you be perfectly united in mind and thought. God, Jesus, God, Jesus, God, Jesus, God, Jesus. He wants to make sure they bump in, they meet the real living God. They don't fashion it after themselves because God is not like us. He doesn't look like us. So here's where I want to go. Here's where I want to go. There is a a Muslim man and he was very upset because his wife became a Christian and he was having it out with this minister and he said, he said to this minister I don't know why this has happened I don't know why this has happened he says we basically believe in the same God we believe in the same God except for you guys have Jesus Christ in the cross. 
And the guy said, that is a great message for Easter. (laughs) You and I have Jesus Christ. But you see, this man had an idea of God, but God was beyond his idea. Here's a really good quote from Ravenhill. Man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by man. Let me say it again. Man or people who are intimate with God will never be intimidated by people. I must say to you, it is time for us to get intimate with God, to meet the true and living God. Okay, Ben, this is where you guys come in. I would like the two corner players. Who do we have? We have one corner, two corner players. It's okay. Trombones. I want one of you to play C and the other one to play C sharp. What do you think? Does it work? Something's missed, right? Okay. How about one of you play C and the other one play B flat? Now, I know some of you are tone deaf. (laughs) But I pray. I pray you can hear the difference there. And what Paul is giving us there is he's giving us the tuning note. He says, Jesus Christ is our C, our, 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 the pitch that we, this is, this is the uniting pitch. Here it is. This is the note. When you go to a concert hall in New York City, in Lincoln Center, uh, the, the orchestra is out, out on the stage and then a few more come in and then, the, then all of a sudden the concert master, we always say to about the concert master, he comes in late, but he comes in and he's the lead violinist. He comes and they sit down and then he stands up and he gives them a tuning note and they all tune to that note. They all tune to that note. They all gravitate to that note. That's their, that's their, that's their place. That's how they know. Now, some, some instruments will play, and they'll play a little high, like we heard, a little high. And what does that, that person have to do? They have to come down. So go from C and C sharp down to the C. C and C sharp. Hear it? Okay, do the C to the B flat. And in some of our lives, folks, we're out of tune with with the Lord. You're out of tune with the Lord. And you have to meet Jesus. And you have to say, there's the tuning note. There's the pitch. And Paul gives us the pitch. It's Jesus. It's God. It's Jesus. It's God. And he's not like us. He doesn't look like us. He doesn't think like us. He thinks differently. And he's, I pray that you meet him. I pray that you meet him. I pray that you will come to him. I pray that you will come. You will meet him. Jesus Christ is our tuning for. Jesus Christ is is, our, is, our, is what our lives are to tune to. Because if you don't, it sounds awful like that. It sounds like it doesn't match. And we have to match ourselves with him. Let me read you from uh, C.S. Lewis, The Silver Chair. The Silver Chair, just to finish here. I don't know if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, very powerful uh, very powerful book series. Uh, they're wonderful to read to your children, the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, very powerful. Let me just read you a segment. And this, the background of this is there's a, there's a character named Jill. And Jill is a young girl. And she's going through the enchanted forest. And she's really thirsty. Really thirsty. So as she's walking along, She comes to a brook and she meets this lion. Now, many of you will know that's Aslan, Aslan the lion. And Aslan the lion represents Jesus Christ. So when I say lion, you know that's Jesus. 
So here's this young girl walking through the forest and she meets the lion who is right by the stream. All right. Are you thirsty? Said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink. Jill said, may I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I drink? The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. As Jill gazed at the lion, she realized she might as well ask the whole mountain to be removed to, be, to move in her convenience. But the delicious, the delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her frantic. Then she said, Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? The lion said, I make no promises. Jill was so thirsty. Without noticing, she took, she took a step and then another step. Then she asked the lion, she says, Do you eat little girls? The lion said, I swallow up little girls, little boys, women, men, kings, rulers, authorities, reigns. I swallow them up. Then she said, he didn't say it as if she, he was boasting or as if he was saying sorry or angry. He just said it. Jill then says, then I better, uh, then I, no, that's wrong. I better go drink. Then you will, I, I better not come and drink. Then you will die, said the lion. If you don't come to the stream, you will die. Oh dear, said Jill, coming a step nearer. Then I suppose I better go and look for another stream. I better go and look for another stream. Then said the lion, there is no other stream. There's no other stream. This is it. God is our faithful stream. God is our wise stream. God is our loving stream. He is not like you and me. But there's no other stream. And I'm calling you to the stream. Come to the real, true and living God. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity and find there is none. There is none like him. He's calling you to himself. He's calling you to himself. He's calling you to himself. If we don't get in tune with him, the true and living God, we will begin to fall and begin to Halifax, let's see if we are on the Lord's side. Are we on the Lord's side? Are we on the Lord's side? Do you know the true and living God? Do you know? Or is he an idea in your mind? He's not like you. He's not like me. He's beyond. He's beyond. I pray that you will encounter the stream. There is no other stream. You come. You come to Christ. Christ. And meet the real living God. Let's, let's sing. Let's sing. He's calling you to himself. He's not like you or me. He's calling us to himself. The true and living God. Here's a song. With the help of the music. <clears throat> Once dear, built my life upon all this world reveres and want to own. All I, all I once thought gain, I have count lost. Let's sing this. All I once held dear, all this world reveres. And wars to own all I once thought gain I have counted.
it lost, spent it worthless now. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're the joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. I just want to sing the chorus again. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you. Oh, that we're intimate. Let's bow for prayer. Oh, that you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The person who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by this world. Oh, that we may get intimidated and intimate with God. He is... He's, he cannot be contained. He's bigger than our ideology, our personal opinions and our theology. Who is like our God? Have you met this God? Looking for God is like fishing for a giant shark. You throw the line over the side and then you strike. And now you have more than you can handle on the line. Is that your experience? Or is he a God of your cause, God of your understanding? He's not a God like you. Just spend a few moments in prayer. I want to sing... Give thanks again in a moment. Lord, I pray and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. Let us never forget. There's nothing our God cannot do. I pray, Lord, that we'll have that intimate relationship with this powerful God. Lord, we can't explain you, but we love you. And we know in our lives that many of us have searched for other streams to find that there is no other streams. You are, you are our stream, Lord. You are the one we love. I pray, Lord, for your help this morning. I pray that we'll all take one step up in our spiritual journey here today. Many are on different steps Oh, Lord, help us. We thank you for this opportunity to talk about you. What a faithful God we serve.